child with Barry, his father passed away. And when his father passed away, the business kind of dissipated. They tried to keep it going, but it, you know, it just went downhill. The inheritance, the large inheritance that was supposed to come from his father, there was a law in New York State at that time that if the father died before the child was born, that he could not get the money, not get his inheritance until he turned 18. So that money was put in a trust when he turned it, when he would, when until he turned 18 i know a lot of details but he turned 18 and because he turned 18 he got the money and he was able to go to yale so even though he had this kind of um poor upbringing he went to school with the rich and wealthy with his very large inheritance ah. and he went to yale for his first three years he wrote several different plays one of his plays or maybe several were actually staged on the yale stage and this was, um, I think, around the early 20s. And then in his, I think his senior year, um, he signed up for uh, the Harvard Drama Harvard drama Workshop run by the great playwright George Pierce Baker. That was just like an amalgamation of all kind of different um, collegiate playwrights that came together and they learned from the George Pierce Baker in this great, this great workshop. So while he was at Harvard, he met, he roomed with and became best friends with a man named Edgar Scott, who was also trying to um, he was also trying to find his way as a playwright. But according to Edgar Scott's grandson, he never could exactly his the dialogue was too stilted. He never could completely uh, write something as great as Philip Berry did. Mm. And at the time, well, at Yale, Philip Berry had met and fell in love with a woman named Ellen Simple, who was a New York socialite. And um, he came back to Ellen Simple, I think, around his junior or senior year, and he said, I cannot marry you because I want to be a playwright, and that will not support your lavish lifestyle. So what ended up happening is she was like, well, I still want to marry you. So the big prize at the Harvard Drama Workshop where he was at was if they won the, like, the, the playwriting contest that was at the end of the Harvard Drama Workshop, then that play, that one, got produced on Broadway. So what happened is Ellen Semple's father told Philip Berry, well, my daughter really wants to marry you. So what's, what's going to happen is if you win this contest, then I will support you in like your lifestyle as a playwright for a year while you try to find your way, Whoa. you know, when your play is produced on Broadway. Right. I know. It's kind of interesting. Um, but if you do not win, then you have to go into a career of business in order to support oh. my daughter, unless you want to get a divorce. Oh. So I know it was kind of sad, but so before he even knew he won, he married Ellen Simple. So he was like, he loved her enough to know that he would consign his life to a life of business, something that he really didn't want to be a part of. I think it was either business or finance. They're the oh. same thing, right? Oh, totally. If anything... <laughs> I don't know. Undergrad taught, if anything, our theater degrees taught us that business and finance are the exact same thing. He married Ellen Simple and they got on the boat to go to their European honeymoon. And while they were on the boat, he got the telegram that he won the contest. Yay! Yay! So he became a playwright. Now, we need to talk about Edgar Scott, who was his roommate. And I, I threw him in there because he's very... He's very influential to the story. Edgar Scott was marrying a woman of Philadelphia mainline money from extreme wealth named Helen Hope, Helen Hope Montgomery. And she was known as like the wittiest and wealthiest young socialite in Philadelphia and a great hostess, but she was body, she was notorious, she was very strong willed but Edgar Scott loved her so much. She lived at her family's state called Ardrossan. Now, I'll get to Ardrossan in just a second, but Helen Holt Montgomery Scott was from Villanova in Philadelphia, where their father had made his fortune in the Baldwin Locomotive Works, and that was a big thing at that time, was the, uh, the railroad ran through the main line in Philadelphia. So what that means is that at the time that the, the, that the railroad was being built through Philadelphia, that um, area directly surrounding the railroad became known as the main line because that was the main line of the ra railroad. And around that railroad, there were like suburban areas that popped up of um, massive estates with people that had become very wealthy from the railroad with massive houses. Helen Hope Montgomery Scott, 
Scott was eventually known as the unofficial queen of Philadelphia's WASP oligarchy. WASPs meaning white Anglo-Saxon Protestants or white American Protestant elite. So, you know, the biggest and the best in white privilege at the time. So anyway, uh, Philip Berry ended up at their wedding. He was in Edgar Scott's and Helen Hope's wedding, and he got to know Helen Hope, and he loved her so much. And anyway, a few years later, she influenced the character of Tracy Lord oh. in the Philadelphia story. Yes. And also, the Broadway program of the Philadelphia story stated those wealthy residents of the Philadelphia main line were a vague mixture to common city folk of debutantes, horses, tea balls, parties, promiscuous youth, society, and money, <laughs> particularly the latter two. And oh, yes, uh, Helen Hope Montgomery Scott was known as something she was very body she was sexually promiscuous um her she thought it was absolutely hilarious that her um stationery had two people pleasuring each other on it and she oh. sent that out to everybody like if they got invited to a tea or a ball or something it was on her stationery her very erotic stationery and she thought wow. that was absolutely hilarious but you know that kind of seems like a thing tracy might do i don't know yeah i could see yeah. it <laughs> yeah, I could see it too. Um, so the character of Tracy Lord, as I just said, was more or less based on Helen Hope Montgomery Scott and somewhat Catherine Hepburn, which we could talk about later. Mm -hmm. So like I said, Philip Berry was at Ardrossan a lot of the time. Now Ardrossan uh, was the home where Helen Hope had been raised, or really Hope Montgomery is what people called her. And like I said, her father had gotten all of the all of his money from like locomotives. It was a 55 room. Oh, trying to think. gosh. Yeah, was, <laughs> so their estate was the size of Central Park, which just seems ridiculous. I mean, I cannot even imagine. It was like 55 room. It was 33,000 square feet. Georgia, Georgian Revival Manor Home in Villanova. So that's where she was brought up. Now, when they started to shoot the Philadelphia story, MGM wanted to shoot it at Ardrossan. Like, that was an idea Louis B. Mayer said, but George Cukor was like, absolutely not. No American would believe that another American could live like this. Wow. He just thought it was too lavish. So they ended up building all of the sets on the sound stages at MGM. Okay, so in 1928, Barry, like I said, he was very well known for writing plays about the, you know, the frivolities of the rich. So in 1928, he wrote a Broadway play called Holiday. And Holiday um, was about, you know, like the frivolities of the rich. And, you know, it's always good to take time off to, you know, have fun and replenish yourself. It, which also starred on Broadway Donald Ogden Stewart, who... Um, who actually wrote the adapted screenplay and won the Oscar for the Philadelphia story, like the adapted screenplay Oscar. So, you know, you can see the group kind of coming together mm -hmm. and all formulating. So Catherine Hepburn was just starting off on Broadway at this point and through like a connection of networks or yeah, through a connection of networks, she ended up being the understudy for the lead in Holiday. So that's really kind of how Philip okay. Berry and Catherine Hepburn met each other. And they, they got along quite well. He wrote another play in 1930 called The Animal, Animal Kingdom that went to Broadway with Leslie Lee Howard, who was Ashley Wilkes in Gone with the Wind. But Leslie Howard did not like Catherine Hepburn. He had her fired off that production, even though oh, Philip wow. Berry had written that play for Catherine Hepburn. And at the time on Broadway, she was not exactly well-liked by critics or audiences she yeah. hadn't completely cultivated her dramatic skills as many people said at that point but in 1932 she ended up in um a very it was a very successful broadway play where she received great reviews and critics uh well audiences loved her and the play was called the warrior's husband in 1932 which where she played a warrior you know the comedy came from like the gender swap of the man staying at home while the woman went out and was the fierce warrior. So she received great reviews from this play. And because of the great reviews, she caught the she caught the eye of Hollywood talent agent Myron Selznick. Do you know who Myron Selznick's brother was? Can you take a guess? I can, but I <laughs> don't, don't make me do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> we won't make you do it. Uh, Myron Selznick's brother was David O. Selznick, and this okay, is 1932. Yes. Right. So David O. Selznick, before starting his own production company, like in 35, 36, 
He was head of production at RKO Studios in 1932. Now, because Katherine Hepburn had received such great reviews, they gave her a screen test. And like the executives at the studio, David O. Selznick, Myron Selznick, did not really like her. They did not like the way she looked. Now, this is a not, not a nice thing to say about anybody. You never should say this about anybody, but one of the top executives thought that she looked like a cross between a horse and a monkey. So he did not want to yes. use her. But she caught the director of the film that they were going to, wanted her for was called uh, well, the director of the film that they wanted her for was George Cukor. They wanted her for the film Bill of Divorcement with John Barrymore and Billy Burke. And John Barrymore of the great Barrymore siblings and Billy Burke, the wife of Florence Ziegfeld, who played Glenda eventually in Wizard of Oz, back to Wizard of Oz. She did a screen test first for John Ford, I believe, which she had another affair with, which is a whole different story. But she caught George Cukor's eye because she did something that a lot of the other actresses in the screen test hadn't done. They didn't like a whole lot of things that she had done because, like, they said she talked too fast. She was too bold and brassy for the camera. She caught his eye when John Barrymore had like this big monologue and she was supposed to let listen and she put her glass down on the table and she stood up and she like looked at him and listened. And that for some reason caught George Cukor's eye because he was like, this actress might actually understand the motivations of this character. Mm -hmm. So he hired her. So George Cukor believed in her from 1932, whereas all of the other studio executives did not like her until the film was released. And audiences and critics loved her. And um, she immediately like skyrocketed to the top of all stars. So then RKO and David O. Selznick offered her like a long-term contract. And then her second or third film, 1934, with um, called Morning Glory, she won the Oscar for that film. So then all of a sudden she was this massive asset for RKO until 1935. And in 1935, she got together with Cary Grant and George Cukor, and they made a film, which I actually like, called Sylvia Scarlet, where she parades around London or New York City. I haven't seen it in a long time. She parades around as a man. And audiences and critics uh -huh. did not like that kind of gender swap at the time, so the film flopped. Uh -huh. It was the biggest... A flop that RKO had ever seen. So from that point on, her career started to decline at RKO. And each and every film after that uh, just got smaller and smaller and smaller in box office revenue, and she became as seen as kind of difficult to work with, but she was supposed to still be a big asset because she had won the Oscar in 1934. And then in 1937, um, I believe, well, RKO, I believe, loaned her out to Columbia, where George Cukor was directing, uh, with Cary Grant starring, um, Holiday, which was the adapt adaptation of Philip Berry's play, uh, the movie. I don't know if you've seen Holiday. I feel before. like I have, um, but it's been a long, long time. It's, yeah. Yeah. The same for me. Um, I can't remember much about it. I know I enjoy, I always enjoy their chemistry. I right. think Carrie, right, Carrie Grant and Catherine Hepburn enjoyed their chemistry, but it was about the frivolity of rich people. And at that time, that was on the heels of the depression leading up to, you know, the World War II, there was already a war in Europe. So the world was like, mm -hmm, frivolities of the rich people, you know, they're not buying into it. So the film oh. didn't do well. But also another thing that kind of greatly affected her career was an article in the 1937 Hollywood Reporter. But what exactly had happened was 1936 box office receipts went up and Hollywood studios increased their production budgets accordingly to, to match the receipts that they thought they would get in 1937. And all of a sudden in 1937, there was this massive recession at the box office that was not in direct correlation to the depression at all. People just got sick and tired of going to the movies because they, they weren't great movies. And so Hollywood kind of went into an existential panic. And this is all according to Karina Longworth of the You Must Remember This podcast. And then that not only affected major motion picture Hollywood studios, but it also affected independent theater owners that were a part of the Independent Theater Owner Association, I think is what the title was of that association. So exactly at the time, major motion picture studios not only owned all of the people working at at their studios under contract, they also owned their own movie theaters. So they were in the art 
of exhibiting as well as creating. So they had to exhibit the motion pictures. Now in 1937, I think it was the judicial department that filed an 